takes uh, 20 minutes to blow a piece of glass, but most of the decisions are made in the last half a minute. ago there was no such thing as a glass artist in America. Today there are more than 2,500 and one of the reasons is master craftsman Dale Chihuly, artist, influential teacher, and co-founder of the Pilchard Glass Center here in Stanwood, Washington. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein for Handmade in America. Dale Chihuly is a man who really loves glass and creates it with incredible speed as many as 30 original pieces in one day. In order to accomplish this, he works with teams of highly skilled assistants. Collaboration is an idea he has pioneered. Glass has been treasured for 4,000 years for its ability to capture and reflect light and for the enormous variety of shapes and color that it can be given. I've heard you mention, Dale, the importance of glass blowers in Venice around 1000 AD. Why were they so needed or cherished? Well, Venice was kind of the wizard of the sea, and also, I guess, uh, the wizard of commerce. And glass had developed into a commodity, and so they built an island outside of Venice called Murano, where they had a couple of hundred factories. And there the glass blowers were kept. In fact, if they, um, if they tried to escape, they were executed. Or if they got away, their, their families were executed. And if they got to uh, England, they were knighted. I've heard glassmakers refer to punchy marks and glory holes. And I suspect that one of the important signs of the master craftsman is a very neat punty mark for which you are particularly celebrated. What do those words mean anyhow? Well, the glory hole is kind of um, a term for um, a volcano of heat where the, the glass is reheated and formed during the process. And a punty mark is after a piece is blown on a blowpipe, the bottom of the piece is, is, is formed first. And then it has to be taken off the blowpipe and transferred with a punty. Mm -hmm. And then the, the top of the piece is opened up. And this punty is sort of this little tenuous 
bit of glass that connects it. The punny mark is, is connected after the blowpipe to the punty rod, and then it's formed and opened up. It's sort of like a, an umbilical cord. Well, I've often wondered where in that early period when glass was such a new medium, and even glass history was not very well known then, where you managed to get your ideas or your inspiration. That always changes, of course, but one, one thing that doesn't change about it is that the material itself is so inspiring. And, and the heat and the gravity is a continual inspiration to new ideas. I mean, I'll, I'll usually have an idea and I'll begin to work on, on, on a concept that, that's maybe intellectual or comes from something that I've seen or read, but then it's taken over to a large extent by the process itself. What is it about that instantaneous quality of glass that's so special for you? Glass offers this, this uh, never-ending variety of forms and shapes. I mean, I'll design something uh, for my crew to work on, and um, it'll be, you know, it's just a rough idea. We're gonna work, you know, we wanna work this shape, um, you know, which I call sort of a, a shell-like, shell -like, you know, boat-like form. And, you know, and I'll make some drawings or we'll work on a few pieces and then I'll say, you know, you know, let's work this shape for a couple of days and see what happens. I mean, and that's, I mean, and, and of course they're all different. And then I have to make the decisions as to which pieces are important. But it's, um, it's this thing about never knowing what's really going to, what's really going to happen. That's exciting for me. Well, I have been in the hot shop at Pilchuk, I guess the very center, the hub of activity here at the Pilchuk School. Not only do you have the benefit of many willing hands to assist you in the process of heating the glass, shaping the glass, forming it, it seems to be the very basis of the process. Is that unusual? Traditionally, the process of blowing glass was always done in a team of from, say, three to 10 people. Um, because usually the beginning steps are less, need less skill than the final steps where the master glass blower does the finishing. And if, the, if the master had to do the starting uh, and the finishing, say he would only do uh, one piece every half an hour, where working in the team they can do one piece every five minutes. Does Pilchuk reflect a particular philosophy of glass or of education? Well, the idea of um, I mean, of course, it's evolved and changed over the 10 years, but we came out thinking that um, if I wanted a place where, where artists could work, produce work, and that students could learn from this sort of like apprentices or like an atelier. I feel that, and a lot of people feel, that it's very difficult to teach about art, and that one of the only ways to learn about art is through uh, experiencing uh, art and being around artists that are active. I mean, the best way to learn about technique is to watch a master glass blower. But the emphasis was never on technique at Pilchuk, and, and hopefully never will be, because the technique comes naturally. I mean, that's what the discussion is about, and that's really what the school is about. It's about the ideas, the concept, and the aesthetics of the work, and the techniques seem to take care of themselves. You say that there are three aspects of working with glass that are particularly important to you, and they're gravity and timing and spontaneity. What do you mean by that, and how important is the spontaneous in the making of glass? I think spontaneity is probably important to almost virtually every art form, but it's, it's really apparent in working with glass because the decisions have to be made um, almost instantly. I mean, you come out with this um, as you've seen from watching us with this molten material that's constantly moving and all the decisions have to be made so it's very spontaneous in terms of approach and it's very spontaneous in terms of a material. First one thick? Barely thick, that's it, you got it. Maybe even two and a half lip wraps. With the forms that I work with, most of the important decisions are really made in about the last 15 or 20 seconds. Yeah, really push this piece, really stretch it. That's all right. Go for the, go for the, go for it, even if it's thin. All right. 
erratical. Really push this one as far as you can. All right. Take it all the way. Move it. That's it. All the way, keep going. Go, go, down. God oh. damn it! Shit. Touchdown. Throw it away. Too big, too big for that size furnace. That was my fault. I, I pushed you too hard on that. I just, you can get those double doors open, but I can't work that size out of that hole. There was too thin, I think, in the middle. What the size? The also that one mold. Gives me that one thin spot on the side. All right, we'll do it again. We occasionally make some glass that gets too thin. And um, if it gets too thin, then I discard it. Uh, but this glass is, is quite strong because although it's very thin, maybe a, say a 30th of an inch thin, um, it's been blown in, in what we call an optical mold, which gives it a ribbing and a strength, not unlike a, a shell um, or a cor corrugated box has a, and so it's, it's, it's really quite, I mean, you know, the way I put it together and move it, and we never break the glass by handling like that. Now, if you drop it or bang it together, it does break. Your most recent series, and I'm, I guess, practically caressing one of them, is this beautiful series of baskets that are referred to as the Pilchick baskets. Where did the idea originate? Well, it was, it was 1977 that um, I had finished one series of work, which I called the blanket cylinders. And then I was really felt that the idea had, had been completed. And I was at one of those periods that I mentioned where I didn't feel very creative. And I was hoping for uh, a change in my work at the time. And, and I was at the Tacoma Historical Society, my hometown. Yes. And uh, I saw these Northwest Coast Indian baskets sort of stacked up um, on top of each other, collapsing under the weight of each other, bending. And I thought, I thought it'd be interesting to try to make these, these forms uh, in glass. And that's really where the idea came from. It's, it's really evolved from that into something that's, that I don't feel is very basket-like, but that's where the idea came from. Well. These vessels, in fact, you referred to the one earlier as having a shell-like shape. For me, they have many marine or sea-like aspects to them, not only in form, but in color and texture. They seem very akin to the sea. Is that a deliberate effect? Well, it's, you know, I love the, the ocean, and, and um, it really somebody had pointed it out to me that they looked sea-like. Uh, about a year ago, and uh, and of course, I, I guess I subconsciously knew that they were looking kind of, you know, aquatic or marine-like, but it really wasn't uh, a conscious thing. And and um, the um, but my real interest was, you know, was form anyway. I mean, it's interesting how how somebody will point something out to you. I don't know if it affects the work, but it affects my dialogue about the work when somebody eloquently explains what might be the derivation of something, it, it you know, makes me look at it to think, well, it does look like a jellyfish. What is, at this point in time, the range of cost of these beautiful vessels nestled within other vessels? My work ranges from about $1,000 to about $10,000. Sometimes I've heard you call yourself glass blower, educator, craftsman, artist. Which term do you prefer to describe what it is that you do? Well, I don't like calling myself an artist. Um, I mean, I like to think of myself as creative. Um, and because I don't do a lot of the work, um, I can't think of myself so much as a craftsman because I'm really now delegating the craftsmanship to, to younger, really extraordinary craftsmen. So I consider myself 
a glass maker or a um, glass worker would be a term I would like. What's the most difficult color glass to create? The most difficult colors are often in the red range. Why red? Uh, it's off, it's one, it's, some of the reds use gold and it's, it's hard to get the gold to work right. And it's, um, it's a, just a color that's very sensitive. Is there any particular reason that so many soft drinks are bottled in that pale green glass? Well, like I said, sand is the basic element of glass, and colors are made from different metal oxides, and green is made from iron, and it just so happens that a lot of sand has a lot of iron in it, and so when they melt the, the, the sand, they, they have a green color because it has a, a high iron content. If they were trying to make the glass very clear, they'd have to, they'd have to get their, their sand from some special mountain that was iron-free. I've heard the expression a number of times about end-of-day glass. What does that actually mean, and do you know what its origin is? And do you do that here? At the end of the day, there's a lot of scraps left over in a, on the floor and in the garbage can, and they'd throw that back into one of the furnaces, and it would melt, and you get all these different colors. But it just so happens that I'm working on a new series of work which involves a multicolored surface. So we are, we are doing something like that, in essence. And what do you call that series? I call it the ugly series, <laughs> just because it's, it's um, the glass is so, I don't know, this glass gets so refined and so beautiful that I, I feel like working with a different palette. Do you collect any of your own work? Not really. I mean, I, um, I occasionally will keep um, a sort of a seminal piece, maybe that, that. Why not? That I don't know. It's um, partly because I'm nomadic. I think I always feel that I could go to the museum and look at it. I hope you don't feel that way about the people who are interested in collecting your work. <laughs> Where yeah. do you store your work? I store it on celluloid. You know, I store it in photographs because. Once I finish making a piece of work like this, then I'll start to play with them and assemble them and try to figure out which colors, which forms work together. And then once I've, I've put this together and I like it, uh, then I want to have it photographed because it's, you know, it's the only record I really have unless I kept the work. Are highly developed facial muscles important in order to be a good glass blower? No. The, um, it, does, it doesn't take any special wind power or in the beginning when you're first learning and you don't know the, the, how to have the temperature of the glass, sometimes you have to blow real hard, but uh, it's really an effortless process in terms of wind power. Uh, when the pieces get large like this, um, it takes a lot of strength, you know, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a big person doing it. I mean, when you're in the factories, you often see some little thin guys handling tremendous quantities of glass. It takes balance and, and understanding of the material, but it does take, when you work large, it does take physical uh, strength to a certain degree. What's your role in the process? I, you know, I'm a glass blower myself, so I can take the blowpipe or the punny rod and, and make the piece, or I can draw the piece, either on a piece of paper and put it up on the wall or on the floor, but most of the communication really comes from we start to work um, and then we, we'll take off on an idea possibly that we'd done last time or maybe I start with some sketches and the real communication will come in the next morning when the work comes out of what we call the leers or the ovens because the glass has to be cooled overnight very slowly. Then we'll look at the work and I'll say, you know, that, now this is getting closer, you know, Ben or Billy to what I want and I want it higher, and then I'll say to, to Rich, who's starting the color, say, for, or to John, um, I want the pink to be, I really want the pink, I want more pink up in here, and I want it to go clear. Yeah, definitely optical for sure, but I want to have this nice, I want to have a nice little pull in over here. Very, pretty, pretty lofty bottom. Optical, with nice threading in through here, Maybe reduce threading. See if you can get it to come up and get that thing coming out the side. Lee, you get the uh, get the wrap ready.
nice, 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 Was nice. Touch down on the lip? No, it's not gonna touch. It's all right. Beautiful, beautiful. Lovely, okay. lovely. Let's go. Is that a double stop? We have the two molds and the two really broad Steiner molds. Yeah. And the one is the fine tooth and the one is the big tooth. Stuffed in the fine tooth, twisted, and then stuffed in the big tooth. Oh, inside. Are you small? Well, here's to some good wraps. One more time. Oh! Big thing! Big thing! You get that? Bad luck, not that spilled one. From the heat of the furnace to the delicacy of the final punty mark, we witness the drama and the magic of the glass making process here at the Pilchuck School in Stanwood, Washington. Dale Chihuly, glass worker educator and the school's co-founder, is known throughout the world for the fluid grace of his glass forms, be they richly embellished cylinders or elegant forms contained within translucent bowls. Dale is as committed to passing on the techniques he has perfected as he is to inventing fresh meaning for this ancient craft. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein for Handmade in America.